you so much for joining. Uh, we are so excited to have you all in our this amazing initiative uh, we are jointly doing with the Center of Migration. Uh, and I'm, I'm surely again, Lara, if I pronounce your uh, organization name wrong, you can make it uh, correct. Uh, so welcome everyone. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and maybe good evening in many part of the world. We are so excited. Uh, to having this um, uh, event today and um, it's, it's quite excited and the reason why we planned to um, uh, this is a, is, is a long uh, kind of journey which we are having and especially COVID they give giving us uh, more opportunity to realize where we are standing and how we want to reimagine the world we really want for our future for ourselves and how we can feel equal and how we can give this feeling to other people around us. So thank you so much. So my name is Anila Noor. I'm a founder of New Moon Connectors and I am also co-founder of CURL, which is Global Independent Refugee Leaders um, uh, Group. And uh, there are many hats which I wear, uh, wear but here right now uh, in front of you, I'm talking as a woman coming from developing country, a woman who is really fighting from my childhood for the equality and gender justice. And I'm here feeling a little bit um, uh, disappointment sometimes when, when we are living in a Europe, but we are facing there are still so much gap and we are really want to solve these gaps. And that's the reason we are showing as resilience. We are showing as a woman of color, as a coming uh, from developing country, living in a Europe as a refugee, we are really trying to show how we can come forward and we can change the narrative and we can work with so many people uh, for the future we want. And uh, Gender equality means equality, equal equity for everyone. And that's why we are trying to here link the, the migration uh, scenario with a gender lens. That's the reason we are aiming for this uh, uh, working conference. And this working conference is really uh, trying our efforts to question of the future and how we can build together to answer of the question of how. So I'm a little bit overwhelmed because we are having so good participants here. We have panelists and I'm going to share my screen so I can share about the agenda, how it looks like. And uh, before uh, that, I will give the floor to Lara, who is our uh, partner in designing and hosting this webinar. And we are so glad to have her. So over to you, Lara. And after Lara, I will uh, share the agenda for today. So Lara, over to you. Thank you, Anila. On behalf of the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice, including my dear colleagues, Miriam, Samira, Abba, Grace Fortson, and Phoebe Anderson, who are here today um, joining me, I would like to also welcome all of you near and far, and thank you for joining us in addressing a very important task to reimagine a truly gender equal and inclusive Europe. I'm Dr. Lara Susan Golosorki, Assistant Professor of Political Science and Global Affairs and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Portland, and also the Founder and Executive Director and Director of Advocacy at the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice, or CMGJ abbreviated. Um, the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice is a nonprofit, non-governmental organization that addresses human rights at the intersection of migration and gender. And we launched the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice on International Women's Day this year. So we're barely six months old, um, out of the belief that gender justice goes beyond borders. And gender justice beyond borders necessitates shared agency, representation, and accountability in protecting human rights for all. And it's because of this vision of gender justice beyond borders that we're part of this conference. Uh, we believe that in order to ensure shared agency, representation, and accountability, we must shrink spaces between governing bodies and migrant communities. And shrinking spaces in the literal and figurative sense is indeed our mission at the Center for Migration, Gender, and Justice. And so this working conference provides exactly that, a platform to shrink spaces between governing bodies and migrant communities. And we look forward to shrinking spaces for good with you today and in future um, collaboration. So as a new organization, um, we're, we're proud and honored to be a co-organizer in this conference. 
uh, we really hope to make good on our promises and our commitment um, here today, particularly with regards to putting gender justice beyond borders at the top of the agenda to protect human rights of migrants on the move and in host countries. Our commitment to advance knowledge and education about migrants' experiences, especially those of women, girl, LGBTQIA+, and gender diverse migrants. Our commitment to denounce anti-migrant and gender-based hatred and violence. And our commitment to promote partnerships with migrant communities and local organizations through our advisory groups, for instance. So we're ready and motivated to put forward a roadmap to a truly gender equal and inclusive Europe that is not confined to any borders, neither by nationality nor by gender identity. Thank you and welcome again. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to share my screen and then I will share the agenda, very quick agenda, because we have a, a whole uh, agenda planned for today's discussion. So you will, um, uh, okay, not this one, I know this one, yeah, right. So this is the agenda the day look like for today. Um, you already have my introduction, uh, but I didn't share my team's introduction. So we are ha having so many partners here as well and so many um, uh, activists, um, uh, refugees, women, statelessness, uh, stateless uh, women, and uh, I'm, I'm quite overwhelmed today. So sorry if I'm <laughs> flubbling a lot. Um, so we are having uh, Shaza, Yafa, Reem, Razan, uh, Zuleha, and many more, even uh, maybe I, I forgot to share their name, but they always support us a lot. So they really help us to make this design. And this design is not only uh, designed for the day, but we are really trying to give out more perspective, more knowledge about how we want to go forward and how being a refugee, migrant or stateless person, how we really want uh, to show our resilience, how we can do it. So we, after um, my this uh, talk, we will invite uh, Dr. Hale Gurashi. Uh, she will give us her uh, experience and knowledge about why is it, there's a gap of uh, gender um, in the forced migration. And after that, we have a very good uh, design, a high panel discussion. We have amazing panelists uh, and it will be moderated by Shada Islam. Uh, and after the panel, I will stop the uh, live stream uh, and we will just have a breakout session of four and we have four themes and I am uh, after the panel, I will introduce more into the themes, uh, um, four themes, and then we'll stay there for one hour. Uh, and then after having our uh, internal discussion as a group in, in each themes, we will come back uh, again this on uh, the closing as a one big group. And then we'll share um, a, a breakout uh, session, uh, uh, what we have discussed, and then we'll have a Q&A and then we'll say thank you to everyone. So uh, I will uh, give the floor and invite um, uh, Professor Hale Gurashi. She's a full professor of diversity and integration in Department of Sociology at Fry University of Amsterdam in Netherlands. And she done a lot of um, struggle of refugee in their path of inclusion from the last 25 years and she herself um, amazing um, uh, author and I, I always look a lot uh, in her readings and in her experience how they, she's uh, trying to give a, a, a lived experience and linking with the knowledge. So thank you so much, um, Hale. We are so excited to have you here. So I will give you a floor and uh, I will request you to start your uh, words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anila. Thank you, um, Lara, uh, for the introductory uh, introduction. Um, uh, I want to first of all congratulate you with this really great platform to discuss the uh, reimagining uh, gender uh, inclusive approach of migration. And I am quite honored to be invited uh, to give the opening speech uh, for your uh, for this conference. Um, I have to say you have chosen a very effective title since reimagining is exactly what we need in this time of crisis and especially when it comes to the position of refugee women. Let me start with some background information. Uh, I came to the Netherlands um, in 1988 as a refugee, refugee myself from Iran. I had to leave my country because of what I was politically active uh, and uh, also feminist in Iran. When uh, in the first years, I, I was asked this question quite often. 
did you experience cultural shock when you came from Iran to the Netherlands? Um, or in, in the first years, did you experience cultural shock? And I always say, no, not a cultural shock, but a shock of image. Because I had this image, self-image um, of myself as a, an activist, somebody who has been um, you know, a fighter in, in, for democracy and freedom in my country, as a feminist uh, fighting for emancipation of women. And the image I was faced with, the general image uh, of me in the Netherlands was that I was as a refugee, a helpless victim who needed to be helped all the time, passive. Uh, and also as a woman from a, a Middle Eastern country, uh, not emancipated enough, so suppressed by my uh, the, the family, uh, male family members. So that was a shock uh, that you can imagine in the beginning. But then I made this uh, uh, actually subject, also subject of my study. I have been doing research about uh, narratives of refugee women inside and outside the organization and institutions for the last 25 years. And uh, what actually, what is the most profound theoretical insight I can share with you um, from this uh, 25 years of research is actually the notion of power and agency. If you think about power um, and the changed nature of this uh, relationship in democratic contexts such as European societies. Um, if you think about re refugees, many refugees are actually used to fight in uh, coercive context, in suppressive context. Refugee women are uh, used to fight in patriarchal context. So when the, the power of exclusion is visible, we know refugees know how to fight. So your agency is very much in the action uh, against a certain kind of structures of exclusion that are quite visible and tangible. But when you come to a democratic society and then the power structures of ex exclusion are very subtle, invisible and non-tangible, then you, you don't know what to fight against, especially when kind of exclusion happens with the good intentions. How can you fight people who are, you know, wanting to help you? And then you see that it, there is a change nature of power that is, makes it almost impossible to, uh, to do, you know, to be agent of, of change in the new context. Uh, and these invisible structures of power come from images. Images, certain images of refugees, certain images of refugee women that are ingrained in uh, institutions and organizations, structures that we are part of, taken for granted, normalized. So they become normalized power as if you think, uh, want to follow uh, Foucault would say discursive power that are everywhere. So you cannot pinpoint the uh, people who are excluding you. It is about the, the, the images that are everywhere. So you cannot know what to fight against. So that is quite confusing. If, um, uh, let's talk about these images. If you think about the images, now I, I see myself uh, mainly, but I don't know what happened. Um, uh, when we think about uh, images, um, if you think about uh, the 1980s and 1990s, uh, the images of refugees were mainly that they are uh, vulnerable victims and receivers of help. Um, and these images have changed somewhat uh, from 2015. Um, refugees have become actually as people at risk, changed to people as risk uh, with very much gendered and rationalized logic behind it. So we see a distinction between refugee men as threat and potential danger to society and refugee women even more vulnerable because when the men uh, are danger, they become even more vulnerable and, and in need of uh, emancipation more. So the notion of invulnerability and passivity of refugee women become even more uh, accentuated uh, after 2015. So um, in this idea of refugee women and passive victims, uh, there is a need from society and from organizations, from NGOs to help them to emancipate and to help them to activate them, actually to be participants of society. This creates a kind of hierarchical relationship between the givers, providers of help that are mostly uh, native uh, Europeans or receivers of help that these are these women. But what happens in the process that their agency 
is completely erased and their competence uh, and qualities completely ignored. We have done a lot of studies in organizations. What you see happening, for example, women who have shown the first generation refugee women who come to, these, uh, uh, to, to their host societies, learn the language, uh, enjoy higher education in the institutions in these countries, uh, actually finalize their, uh, their education with flying colors. But when they want to be um, uh, treated equally in the job uh, labor market in organizations, it doesn't happen. They always as, as uh, considered to be not good enough or competent enough to, uh, to get a job at their level. So these, um, and, and, and language, uh, lack of perfection in language is often used as one of the examples of exclusion. So what you see happening that these women have done the best to be part of the society. But in, uh, because as, as we know, the first generation uh, migrants and refugees, when you learn the language and you're older, you never um, actually become perfect as native. That is all the studies show that. But the expectation, expectation in organizations is that you are near native. And what happens then that they are often uh, uh, considered to be less uh, competent because of their accents or because of some small mistakes they, they, they make when they use the language. And this, um, I have done this research for years. And recently I had a focus group with some women that I did research 20 years ago with. And I, now I see after 35 years or 30 years living in the, in the country uh, and facing this situation, they feel actually quite hum humiliated. It is not about only the loss of their agency. They feel that they are constantly considered to be inferior. And if uh, whatever they do in terms of action, does not erase this, this, uh, this um, lens that is on them. Uh, and this is a lens that we call in organization studies, um, deficit uh, lens, lens of deficit that actually you, when you want to talk about diversity in organizations, you always think about the shortcomings on the of the people who are, or want to, whom you want to include. Shortcomings, so it's, uh, about gender, for example, is often fix the woman and then we will be diverse or fix the refugee, then we will be diverse. So never, the discussion is never about the inclusive uh, climate or structure in organization, but all is about the shortcomings of the other. And this fixation of these shortcomings in organizations really uh, demotivates and even uh, uh, makes women to lose their self-confidence -con because what can you do? And who can you fight actually? Because it comes sometimes with ideas of, you know, we want to help you to improve your language. So we don't want to exclude you, but at the end they are ex excluded to be uh, the place they, they, they deserve to be. In terms of policy, uh, we see that, for example, in the Netherlands, that um, when we think about policy uh, about refugees, it, the, the policy is mainly towards men. So male refugees are, are the receivers of policy. And the idea uh, uh, of gender relations uh, is often a very traditional idea. So the idea is that men are the, the ones who won't work and women are the ones who stay home and take care of children. So it's not so much the traditional gender roles of the refugee communities, but it's more from the policy lens that they consider refugees to, to have this part of the, uh, traditional gender role. And uh, one of the examples that came out of the research was that, for example, an assistant professor with a PhD uh, who came from um, a worked at a Syrian university and had to uh, come to the Netherlands um, became completely dependent of her husband because the husband was um, this, the, the sole receiver of the policy and she actually had to stay home. So she became completely depressed and, and lost her uh, abilities. Um, so, uh, and that these are many examples of active women uh, who come to the host societies become passive because of the policies of the host society. So, what happens is that powerful women who have shown resilience and agency against patriarchal and political suppress suppressive contexts of their homelands become passive and lose their agency in their host societies. Because they were used to fight and negotiate power of suppression when it was visible. 
but when they become paralyzed, when the power of exclusion is so supple, subtle and ungraspable, there are no dictators who exclude them, but exclusion comes from biases that are ingrained and taken for granted in everyday interaction. It comes from people who wants to help them, but they actually, in doing so, reproduce uh, the bias that excludes them. So how can we fight people who want to help us? In this process, many refugee women do not lose their self, only lose their self-confidence, but also they lose their resilient capacity to act in building a new life in their whole society. So if you really want to reimagine gender equality in migration, we need to start with unsettling biases in our minds, in our practices as policymakers, academics, professionals and activists. And even more is to think about conditions that are necessary to create reflection about these biases in our institutions and our organizations to be able to create inclusive practices beyond the good intentions. Because actually, it is often so that good intentions without reflect, reflection reproduces the existence of these biases uh, that I mentioned before. So we cannot have um, in inclusion, inclusion without reflection. Inclusion starts with reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hale. Thank you so much. It's like so overwhelming. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your uh, thoughts with us. Uh, now I will. Uh, I had a few things to share, but I just um, uh, looking on the time. And uh, though I had a few my own experience to share, but I am not doing that anymore because we have amazing panelists and uh, speakers and uh, so many uh, stakeholders with us right now. Uh, so I right away uh, jump into uh, our panel discussion because I know everyone is ready to listen to our amazing panelists. I will now um, invite. Uh, uh, Shada Islam, who is not only a very good uh, good advisor for New Women Connector, but she's also an amazing uh, speaker. And everyone who is in a, uh, in mall in Brussels lobby, they know them and they know her. So thank you so much, Shada Islam. So, um, you know, contributing towards our uh, an imaging um, conference. And we are really thankful to have you as a moderator for high level panel discussion. So I will hand over to you for the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anila. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hale, uh, your intervention is really inspiring. It's such a pleasure. And also, I have to say, uh, informative to hear what you've had to say, because many of the things you've said resonate, I'm sure, very strongly with everyone here. And sometimes, you know, we don't have the words. Uh, we don't even have the vocabulary uh, to, to say the things that you have managed to say with such power and potency. So thank you very much. Uh, Anila, thank you for inviting me to uh, moderate this uh, debate. And, you know, we've had a brilliant start and I'm not going to waste time introducing the topic because both of you have done it so well. We're going to enter um, right into the, the nuts and bolts of this discussion. Uh, the focus being very much on how do we engineer, how do we craft these new approaches? Uh, how do we find the solutions? Uh, to make Europe uh, really gender inclusive. Uh, and that means also bringing in the voice, as you said, Anila, of migrant women, refugee women, stateless women, diaspora women, uh, to make it really uh, gender equal Europe with no differences and no exclusion. Um, to explore the, the question further uh, with me, we have a stellar panel. Um, uh, but a, but a big panel, so uh, my plea to all of the panelists uh, uh, is to be short and snappy so we can have a conversation really. And then also my aim is to get questions also from our, our, our participants. And uh, Anila, you've given me until uh, 15.45 for this important discussion. So I'm going to introduce you panelists very briefly, forgive me. Uh, it's not being rude, but uh, your CVs, your uh, biographies are very impressive. That's why you're here. Um, and they're all, uh, I think, easily available on, on our website. So um, kicking off with Jean Lambert, she's a former British MEP from the Green Group. Uh, Jean, it's lovely to see you again. Um, and I'm really glad that we're uh, engaging with each other on these panels. Uh, also with us, uh, Mary Kuter, uh, a counselor, a very well-known figure in Brussels and beyond. 
She's a counselor on migration at the Canadian Mission to the EU, taken part in many uh, engagements with me. Uh, Jacqueline Hart, she's senior uh, ad advice director for uh, strategy, gender equality and inclusion at the Women's Refugee Commission. So Jackie, thank you for joining us as well. We have Nuria Diaz Gardia, and she's from the integration team at the DG Migration and Home Affairs at the European Commission. Thank you, Nuria, for being here as well. Caroline Brass from the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And last but not least, our dear friend Shaza Al-Rihawi, who is uh, chairwoman of the Global Refugee-Led Network. So a brilliant panel of women. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm privileged to lead this debate. As I said, short and to the point, and so we can get uh, use the chat button, please, um, to get this conversation really interactive. So Jean, a very simple question to you. Uh, Hale has told us all about the, the fact that refugee women, migrant women, when they arrive in Brussels are treated as uh, helpless victims, um, and they're not given any agency or any actual, uh, let's say, empowered to take part in conversation. So you, as a politician, an active politician, what do you do? You see these as the main barriers, and my question would be: How do you think we can overcome these uh, uh, impediments? Jean, over to you. Screens over to you. Great, thank you, and thank you very much for the opportunity to to be here. Um, but I, I I was really interested in what Hala was saying in, in the introduction because it's I think that's absolutely true that. Um, for, for whatever reasons, and some of them are, are very positive, you know, well-meaning reasons, that women, particularly women refugees, are seen as um, people, and also I think in the field of migration, in regular migration too, the women are seen as the people who follow the men, um, as, as if women haven't made even their own decision to, to leave or their own decision to migrate for, for labour market purposes. Uh, for, for whatever reason. And I think that that brings with it a lot of the distortions in policy as well that Hala was saying, although it also brings some very positive things. If you look at, you know, what um, some of the changes, for example, that the parliament made in asylum legislation, it's because we were hearing the voices of women within that, um, with, within that, that, that process. But I think one of the things in particular, in terms of what European Union would call regular migration, is there is a real absence of voices there um, from women who have chosen, or you know, in the broadest sense, to migrate for to work. And part of that is because, whereas for refugee side, we will have ECRE, we will have various organisations, European Women's Lobby will pick up quite often on refugee policy as it affects women. When it comes to straightforward migration, as it were, there is no single organization that speaks for migrants in general, even less is, are there sort of specific organizations that will speak for women across the whole experience because people come for different purposes, the legislation is different. So those who are interested in seasonal work are not necessarily the ones who also want to advocate for highly qualified migrants. And there is a real shortage of research too about women in migration, particularly at the more highly qualified level. So there is that um, dispersion of voices and sometimes not the voices aren't even there. In terms of the way in which I think the parliament looks at this, we have the women's committee and therefore everybody assumes that the women's committee will look after women in every way. Um, but that doesn't necessarily move across into the other committees, exactly as the Commission is highlighting now in the gender equality strategy it's looking at. It doesn't flow across. There is no um, sort of regular way in which you can say, have we consulted women on this particular issue? Which women have we consulted? Even though we're supposed now, um, the Parliament is now supposed to list the organisations it's talked to. So Parliament doesn't go looking. It may not find the organisations that it wants. And of course, there are reasons you don't always find the organisations. Sometimes they don't exist. But of course, they're all of the things about resources, um, understanding of the process, how people can feed in. 
And so for me, I think the key thing is that those of us in politics have to go and make the active effort to look for the people who are going to be directly affected by the policy that we are creating. And we need to do that not only at the European level, but at the national level, where sometimes it is easier to find organisations. So the first thing is to go looking. I mean, there are all sorts of other things, you know, about people who want to look and what they can find, but maybe we can come back to those later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jean. Uh, I, I've always said that as well. I think one of the problems we have is that we work in silos. And so what you've said is, is really the case that if you have a women's committee, which isn't actually consulting in a more inclusive manner, that leads to distorted uh, policies that you said. And a very strong point um, about go looking. And that's, uh, that's a, a, a problem in many parts of the EU, I have to say, where because they're so huge and they have their networks, there's an assumption that everyone uh, that needs to be engaged with will come themselves. Uh, but I think more and more we see when talking about minority communities, migrants, refugees, you actually have to go that extra mile. So two very strong points already there, Anila and Hale, I think that we need to sort of look at carefully as we move on. Um, I will have some questions for all of you and I'm sure uh, our, our participants will as well, but let's move on and listen to Mary now. So Mary, um, uh, in many ways, we all look to Canada. <laughs> we all think of Canadian policies as being more inclusive, celebrating diversity, also very sensitive, if you like. And I was, and you, of course, Mary, engage uh, not only with the EU institutions, but you're also engaged with think tanks and experts across uh, Brussels and Europe. What is the, uh, what is your um, advice uh, on this issue that? Uh, uh, Jean has pointed out to, you know, this lack of inclusive uh, discussion, consultation, how is Canada doing it and are there any best practices you can share with us? Right, well thank you very much Shada and thank you to Anila and the organizers of this conference for including me. Um, I look forward to sharing with you the positive impacts of gender equality and inclusion on my country, on Canada. Uh, and specifically, I'll speak about one of our pilots, which is the Visible Minority Newcomer Woman pilot and some of the early outcomes from that pilot. Advancing gender equality at home and abroad. Sorry, I'm losing. Uh, ah, there we go. Uh, advancing gender equality both at home and abroad is a key priority of Canada's feminist government. It's an approach based on addressing inequalities and advancing human rights, taking into account all forms of discrimination based on sex, race, ethnicity, place of origin, color, religion, language, sexual orientation, gender, identity, age, ability, or migrant or refugee status. Canada's feminist government values inclusion, diversity, and empowerment of women and girls. GBA plus or gender based analysis plus is one of the primary and mandatory analytical tools we use to achieve this goal. We've been challenged to understand and to implement the intersectionality lens into our work and I can tell you that it's not only benefited us as policymakers and decision makers, but it's also allowed us to be more responsive to newcomers themselves. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, it was known that visible minority newcomer women often face multiple barriers to employment, including gender and race-based discrimination, precarious or low-income employment, lack of affordable childcare, and weak social supports. Today, I wanna to highlight some of the gender dimensions of integration in Canada, with a focus on the initiative uh, that I mentioned, Visible Minority Newcomer Women Pilot, uh, which is targeted towards economic immigration or integration support. So in October of, in our October 2018 federal budget, we announced a pilot to support employment related programming for visible minority women, uh, totaling 31.9 million over three years, starting in uh, fiscal year 2018-19. Uh, it was launched in December of 2018 with an aim to support employment and career advancement of visible minority newcomer women in Canada outside of Quebec. Uh, and it aimed to do so through increasing the existing uh, effective services that were already available, also establishing partnerships with 21 organizations new to the department for projects based on innovation, capacity building and digital and online learning. 
also through testing and evaluating the effectiveness of those programs uh, of employment related services for newcomer women uh, in partnership with the Social Research and Demonstration Canada. Um, the program design phase, I think, was particularly important. Uh, it was informed by broad consultations, a literature, literature review, uh, but also focus groups with uh, visible minority newcomer women themselves. And those early uh, consultations demonstrated that newcomer women often newcomer women often focus on getting their family settled, childcare needs, which may delay entry into the workforce. Client-centered supports uh, can help newcomer women build confidence to meet workplace requirements for structure and routine, including peer mentoring. We found employers need to be engaged uh, early to inform the design of interventions training and as a means of addressing systematic uh, barriers, uh, including discrimination. And we also found that different regions have very different experiences and we need to learn from one another uh, and support collaboration and increase partnerships. Uh, so in terms of an update on the pilot, uh, in 2019-20, more than 2,500 clients participated in activities related to this pilot, including a variety of employment-related services such as work placements, mentorships, and employment counseling support, helping them to acquire knowledge, skills, and connections to prepare for the Canadian labour market. Um, we also facilitated access to services for visible minority newcomer women by supporting the provision of support services to over 1,550 pilot participants. And this includes things like childcare. Um, since 2018-19, a total of 40 organizations have received funding under the pilot. Um, the pilot will conclude in 2021-22, and the results will then be used to inform the design and delivery of employment-related services for newcomer women offered under our settlement programs. Um, I know time is short, but I'll make one last point around COVID-19. Um, I think it's important to mention that uh, newcomer women are particularly impacted by the COVID-19 uh, economic repercussions with a 41% drop in female employment in Canada in low wage jobs and many more in precarious financial or employment situations. Uh, the pilot that I mentioned is proceeding uh, within the current operational environment of COVID, which means that we've had to move uh, all of the direct service delivery onto an online or virtual space with adjustment to some of our project parameters. Uh, we also are continuing our online service delivery in the research uh, space, um, and the pilot's uh, learnings may inform future interventions uh, with regard to economic recovery. So there is, um, I think, a wealth of knowledge in what we've been doing, but I would um, just emphasize uh, in this example, having chosen this example, it was because of the very early consultation uh, and focus on collaboration uh, with the clients themselves very early in the process. So I'm very happy uh, to share additional information. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Mary. So as you said, early consultation and then um, focusing on employment and then I guess flexibility in the sense that you've been able to move things very quickly online. Uh, but of course, thank you for mentioning COVID-19 because that raises all number of new issues that need to be dealt with. Though I have to say in some of the conversations I've had with uh, EU policymakers, um, Nuria can perhaps uh, jump in afterwards on it, um, COVID-19 and the fact that so many essential workers uh, have been from migrant and refugee communities has actually perhaps, Halle, done something positive to change the image of powerlessness or impotence because a number of refugees actually jumped in using their basic skills, uh, their knowledge and, and their real qualifications, if you like, uh, to come to the help and assistance of uh, if you like host host communities, so there is an there was an impression, and the Joint Research Center of the EU did a study um, that we spoke about um, in some conferences, which showed that there was a, a positive uh, impulse and, and perhaps uh, something worth discussing later on. Um, thank you very much, Mary, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, I would like to uh, continuing on the same kind of path that we've started off about how do we actually include the voices, the experiences. And how do we, you know, Mary talked about early consultation. Uh, is the EU, are our institutions doing enough consultation early or late 
or midway? And how do we actually, in an organization like yours, get that those voices heard into, into the policy making machine? Thank you. Jacqueline? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate. This is an amazing dialogue and um, you know, I think we've all been on a lot of webinars and dialogues. My hat's off to Anila and the organizers um, for this uh, really already so powerful conversation. Um, I really appreciate the comments of the speakers before me and want to um, offer a quote um, from a civil rights activist in the US, Fannie Lou Hammer. Um, many people have used this quote in different ways nobody is free until everybody is free. And I think that um, these are a lot of the themes that um, the you know, speakers and experts have addressed already. Um, the issue of uh, the inherent bias and the way that um, migrant refugee women are sort of constructed and then acted on, which means that, that their skills, their agency, um, is not recognized, nor is it supported adequately. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that critical issue of if we are thinking about gender equality um, and human rights, that if we are failing um, migrant women, refugee women, um, with all of the intersectional identities um, that we all have and that society creates in terms of marginalization, then we are simply failing um, in terms of our policies. So, um, you know, at the Women's Refugee Commission, we really focus on how we can use research um, to um, serve as a bridge by elevating and helping to support the visibility of um, expertise and resilience and knowledge of migrant and refugee um, women. And I think one of the issues that has been um, touched on here, which is you know, the rising um, advent of gender ideology um, globally and in Europe, um, really the patriarchal and xenophobic ideas that um, of course shape how any policy is implemented and certainly gender equality policy. Um, really needs to be grappled with. And that's part of, um, you know, the bias and the implementation of, of policy. Um, and I'd like to really say, you know, um, the issues around solidarity and common cause, you mentioned the silos that exist that prevent us from working. I think at the EU, at the national and subnational levels, to really think critically about common cause and solidarity across social movements and sectors um, so that we can understand that women's movements need to really adequately be engaging with migrant women's movements, right? That labor includes importantly, um, you know, we just heard about the ways in which essential workers were, so many essential workers were migrant women. Um, so to really think about Resourcing common cause, um, I think, is a is a critical way forward in terms of addressing this issue of consultation, not just consultation between civil society um, and policymakers, but but amongst civil society to build that collective power. I think is part of um, what's missing in terms of what we need to resource and build on. Um, there is the way in which the good intentions, um, as was noted at the beginning, you know, uh, there's a great expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So how can we actually critically understand um, where each um, social movement is coming from, what the agendas are so that we can build a collective agenda that centers um, refugee and migrant women who are so often left out of the conversation and certainly not because of their own um, really uh, very smart activist and um, highly skilled ways of uh, engaging in the labor market and in social movements. Um, and then I would say that, uh, you know, to think about resources 
and the way in which we consider resources that has to do with funding and also has to do with power. So um, in terms of funding, to pay more attention to the, the um, requirements to fund civil society organizations, in particular to fund multiple levels of women-led refugee and migrant civil society organizations, and especially to, to resource the spaces that build that solidarity. Um, you know, it's often the case that, um, you know, institutions and people with power um, really are effective when they divide and conquer. And this is what we're seeing with the rise of gender ideology and xenophobia and patriarchy really um, being part of how resources are allocated more and more. Um, and then um, finally, the issue of really getting funding and sharing power with those organizations and those leaders um, also has to do with reconceptualizing from the funder point of view and the policy point of view where there is risk. How can we think about risk differently? It's not about, can I give this money to a women-led civil society organization that's run by migrant women, right? How do we reconceptualize what it means to not fund them, right? We, we risk a lot by not funding the right civil society organizations and continuing to fund UN and INGO organizations who are truly not in and of those communities. Um, and then um, finally, I think the issue of really robust accountability mechanisms and ensuring that the accountability from subnational to national to EU civil society and policy is actually a really explicit process that is resourced and that has, again, sort of a shared common cause across these multiple issues um, so that we are actually building momentum and we're building on each other's efforts instead of um, you know, competing with each other. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. So thank you very much indeed. You've talked uh, about the need for common cause. Uh, the competition shouldn't be there for resources uh, and uh, the uh, importance of accountability. There's a question uh, from the participants that I, I, I think needs to be put to you about uh, your definition of gender ideology. I think it's a, it's, it's a worthwhile question for you to uh, come back in very quickly before I move on to uh, Nuria. Please. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Yes, I'm sorry to, to use the, the jargon, which I realize <laughs> might be used differently in different spaces. So um, in the conversation around gender ideology, we're really um, referring to um, the rise of uh, nationalistic movements um, that are xenophobic, um, patriarchal, um, and racist. Um, they undermine the, the rights of um, you know, people with multiple marginalizations um, who, uh, for example, if you can, you can see the rise of the right against LGBTQ rights, you can see the rise of the right and gender ideology in the ways in which um, there's you know, anti-migrant um, policy and sentiment that is existing not only at a policy level, but also um, within society, you know, it, within sort of um, countries and cultures in the way that, um, you know, migrants, for example, the, the issue of, you know, the, the male refugee is seen as dangerous and taking away your job, right? So there is, there is a growing movement around the world that we that some of us you know refer to as gender ideology but that has a critical racist and xenophobic uh, component to it mm. thank you thank you very much and i was looking for the for the full uh, for the gallery view thank you very much uh for that jacqueline so uh nuria uh, let me turn to you uh basically asking you whether 
the your institution, the European Commission, Home Affairs, uh, Migration, um, you do engage uh, a lot with civil society organizations. Have you given adequate attention? Have you consulted adequately? Uh, refugee women, migrant women's associations. And I guess this is going to be especially uh, pertinent now because there is going to be an integration uh, communication, policy communication coming in soon, coming out soon from the European Commission. So your uh, insights, please, the screen's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Shada. And thank you, everybody. It's a joy to be here and to listen to all of you. And if I can take just 30 seconds to say before I answer your question, but I really felt like uh, uh, engaging to some of the things that have been said before, especially about the images, the silos, and the go-looking. So I think go-looking will take me to answer your question, but about the images, I wanted to share with you that I basically I agree so much with a lot of what has been said until now. And in terms of images, I think there is this bias in policies in people's heads, in policymakers' heads of migrant and refugee women that tend to be uneducated and have children and uh, several children. And this is something that when you look at the evidence, it's, uh, it's not bound by the evidence because we have a lot of data showing the, the, the high qualifications level attainment of many migrant and refugee women. And in fact, the problem is more that migrant refugee women are overqualified for their jobs. So they are losing, they are de-skilling themselves in jobs that are not, uh, don't require the qualifications they have. So it's actually almost like the opposite. It's true that there are migrant refugee women who may have low skills and need to upskill themselves. That's certainly true. But I think there is this image that prevails in this policy discussions and debates. But when you look at the analysis, and there's some uh, joint research uh, center analysis forthcoming, in addition to the one on essential workers, another one on gender gaps that will show this quite clearly. And, um, and also the fact that policies are, um, um, how should I say, the fact that when you look at the outcomes of migrant women, uh, on the labor market, you see that they are different if you look at countries in the EU like Sweden or like Poland or Spain or Italy, they are different in different countries. And this is basically showing that the policies are different and that some countries are better and others are less good at, at facilitating the labor market outcomes of migrant and refugee women. But I think that even in the countries where the outcomes are relatively good, Still, we have assessments by the policymakers that they are not providing the same services to migrant women, for example, in public employment services. This is the case in Sweden, for example, which is in many aspects a very good example to follow. Still, the public employment service has noticed that they don't give the same attention to migrant women as migrant men. The same happens in Germany, where there's analysis about refugee women, and they have less access to language courses and refugee men, even though they declare a very strong intention to learn the language and to participate. So I very much agree with what you were saying. And then the go looking, uh, I think I liked a lot, I don't know who said this, but it's true that we have to go looking definitely much more than what we're doing. So I cannot talk for the whole, um, I, I will talk for the whole, my whole institution, but definitely it's important to say that in uh, the area of integration, we are preparing a new policy it will be adopted by the end of this year. And we've done what we think is a quite an uh, open consultation uh, because we've launched a public online consultation, which when we think in the commission, we really think this is the way to target everybody because it's public, it's online, everybody can respond. So in, when we think about this, we think this is a way, an inclusive way of consulting. Yet we've been following this and the consultation is closing tomorrow. So it's been open since a bit before the summer, it will close tomorrow. And we're seeing uh, week after week that it's mostly, that uh, we cannot say who, we can only look if the respondents are third country nationals or EU nationals. And we see that third country nationals, so we can assume they're migrants, they are only seven, eight percent of the respondents. So this is something we've tried to address with, um, with communication, with the European website for integration. We've really tried to, to make this consultation better known. And yet we have this figure that is really basically yeah, max, a maximum of 8% of respondents are, are migrants. We've completed this uh, public consultation with some more targeted consultations with organizations. So that we've done, uh, we've been doing in September and October, and we've also participated to, to consultations. And this was the most, um, it was very enriching, but there I, I have to say that we have relied on the organizations themselves 
to basically organize consultations of migrant and refugee women to which we've joined and we've participated. But this is something we have uh, relied on the civil society organization themselves to do it. Um, I think perhaps that's a bit to answer. And also perhaps the last thing is that this consultation, you were right to say it's before, during and after. And I think that we have to continue it. So it's, we always think in the commission, we do a public consultation, then we present a policy. But in fact, we have then to continue this consultation to also explain what have we done in this policy. And some of the ideas that were brought by, by people were not followed, for example. And we also have to explain why. And then we have to also in the implementation, because this, there's often a lot of attention to the proposals made and the communications adopted. But then the whole implementation that follows, this is where I think we can we will benefit very much from continuing the consultations. And uh, I'm sorry if I took a little bit too long, but uh, thank you no, for the thank opportunity. You. Thank you very much, Nuria. Thank you very much. And indeed, I think the monitoring process, uh, once policies are, are implementing, I think uh, having uh, a wider, more inclusive monitoring process, um, especially for um, policies and actions that do uh, involve many stakeholders mm -hmm. is, is, is very important. And it's something that I think is, is uh, you brought up the question of implementation. And I think that, and when I think Mary talked about accountability, I think that's where these, um, this inclusive consultation process, monitoring, implementation is, in, is necessary. I just wanted to also, you said, you, so you've actually, to some extent, relied on civil society organizations to have done their due diligence and then come to you. But I think there was a point that Jacqueline made, which if, if I'm not wrong, I noted down as sometimes uh, women's movements are reluctant to engage with uh, migrant women and refugee women. And I think that's one of the reasons we're actually having this conversation. Um, I think there's something to take, keep in mind that there is, as Jacqueline pointed out, the question of power struggles and, and, and competition uh, there as well. So it's something that you should really be, I mean, I'm sure you are uh, aware of. Mary, I'm, uh, I'm quite, uh, I know that you have to leave very quickly. So if you have something very quickly to say, to add to what you've heard so far, before I turn to Caroline and Shaza, uh, I'll take your voice now. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just want to come back to some earlier comments. I, I wish I could say, because it's a fascinating discussion. Um, and there was one point when that was made, I think it was Jacqueline, and we were talking about uh, migrant women-led organizations and how important it was. And in the pilot that I was speaking about, in the process of an expression of interest for the funding, um, it was quite uh, uh, unprecedented for us, where we were giving priority to visible my, uh, minority newcomer women managed or focused organizations. So actually looking for those organizations who may not have been able to um, get funding previously, but to prioritize them. And I, I think that that was hugely effective. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for doing that, Mary. Very, very good point to make. Uh, Caroline, um, uh, I don't see your video on, but um, like to bring you into the conversation. So your comments and insights on what's been said. And I think one of the questions that the organizers wanted me to ask you had to do with age, gender and diversity policy. Um, how can you uh, engage uh, more uh, effectively and meaningfully uh, in, in these on these questions? So can I have you? The screen Great. is yours, Caroline. Thank, thank you so much, Shara. And I apologize. I just realized that my video is not working. So I'm all oh. here, but okay. okay, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you also to the organizers for the invitation today. As already said, it's an incredibly important event, important topic, and I'm honored to be part of this discussion. I just wanted to open by saying very quickly that, of course, more than half of the world's refugee persons are women and girls, and gender equality is therefore fundamental to every aspect of UNHCR's work, whether this is a partnership promoting leadership, equality and access to services, economic empowerment, etc. So across the whole board. And we do, as an organization, have very clear policies to that regard, uh, including in this age, gender and diversity policy we have from 2018, which has five concrete action points on gender equality across the world and, and clear commitments uh, to, to our staff and all our work in that regard. On a more practical note, uh, I wanted to say um, we see on a daily basis that female refugees and asylum seekers, just by virtue of their gender, do face additional challenges also in Europe. 
including safety and security concerns, uh, social isolation, difficulty in accessing healthcare, inadequate housing and a lack of access to the labor market, just to name a few. I would say also recently in particular concerns around mental health and family separations are often come up in our conversations with refugee women and girls in, in different countries. And as Mary touched upon earlier, much of this of course worsened with, with the COVID pandemic. But also, as you also indicated a bit in your question, Shada, the challenges are not the same for all refugee women and girls. It's essential to keep this in mind and really look at issues of intersectionality, not put everyone in the same box. And I think some of the aspects to look at, obviously, besides age, family composition, caretaker responsibilities, and it's also the discrimination within and between communities. And, and I would like to maybe urge particular attention to three groups, if I may, which very often stand out in the work that we do. Uh, one of them being LGBTI persons, which face very particular challenges in many countries in Europe. Uh, we recently did the study on refugee women in the UK, which is called Safer and Stronger, which highlighted really serious uh, concerns around violence and threats, uh, the need for specialized mental health support, targeted integration efforts, and highlighting the role, I think, of local LGBTI networks in all of this. Another group is, is ethnic minorities, of course, uh, looking at uh, Roma, Skali, uh, Egyptian origin, for example, in Kosovo. And the third group being older women. Uh, the numbers are quite small in percentage in Europe, but we've really seen some quite serious concerns in terms of isolation, mental health, and access to services uh, now aggravated by the COVID crisis. And maybe also the digitalization of, of a lot of the work and, and services in Europe. So in terms of solutions, as Anila mentioned at the beginning, we should focus on the how. I would like to highlight two actions also touched upon, I think, by several of the previous speakers, but really the need for broad consultation. And they're really having the diversity of communities and within communities in mind. And secondly, promoting equal and meaningful participation and really looking at the individual agencies uh, and capacities of refugee women. I think this is the only way to ensure that all refugees concerns and priorities are more clearly understood and that no one in particular women and girls remain invisible or overlooked in this context. And I wanted to echo here, uh, this is actually one of my key talking points, but since Jacqueline talked about it so, so well, I'm just gonna refer back to it and, and echo what she said in terms of the, how essential it is to fund and partner and give visibility to refugee led organizations as voices and, and agents of change. Um, I think those are the main points I wanted to highlight and, and really um, thank everyone here for, um, for, them, for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Thank you very much indeed. Let me uh, move on to our final panelist. I'm getting weird things on my screen. I want to see Shaza. There we are. So Shaza, um, one of the things we haven't really talked about so much in this conversation, but you know, obviously, uh, in, in other in other fora we have, but that's gender based violence. Um, and uh, for refugee women, asylum seekers, uh, in the country of origin, during the journey, on arrival, um, I'd like you to sort of touch on that topic so that becomes part of the conversation we're having at the moment, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shada, for this. And thanks for the organizer for inviting me. I'm here uh, just to let you know as a, a GRN, Global Refugee Led Network, and also as a girl, uh, like uh, a global, uh, a global independent uh, refugee women leaders. Uh, actually, we have this organization, or what we can say, like refugee-led uh, uh, organization, because we we found that uh, refugees and migrants and women as well are really needed to be there to show their voices and their uh, uh, implementing in all these uh, policy steps and and. Uh, uh, process. 
Uh, actually, regarding to the uh, domestic abuse and HGBV, uh, it's really uh, so obvious that uh, women in, in, uh, in their country of origin are facing a lot and they are exposed to uh, a lot of uh, uh, various forms of the, the, the violence like uh, mental, maybe it's uh, sexual or even physical, and this is not stopped there. And they even uh, targeted during the, the journey of, of migration or, or seeking asylum. And then also, uh, unfortunately, if, uh, if what we can say that this is continued to stay with them even in Europe, like where sometimes as a migrant, I'm talking from the migrant background or refugee background, uh, we thought that oh, oh, we were rich, the heaven, we were rich with the, the first world where everything is, uh, perfect there and unfortunately we face this um, uh, truth that even the host community still having some problems women in, in EU the, in the native EU women also still suffering from uh, uh, inequality and some kind of uh, violence so uh, I think uh, women continue here to be violent violated and uh, facing a lot of uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, SGBV uh, forms like uh, discrimination. She will be discriminated because of her race, of her uh, religion, of her minority, of her, like if she's disability or her even sex uh, uh, identity. So uh, we can see that many, many different forms of, of uh, sexual and uh, gender-based violence are happened. And the problem here is the barriers. Like women in her country, maybe she knows the language, she knows where she can say, seek asyl uh, services or support, but here with this language barriers as well. And uh, the new, host community where she doesn't know anything or whatever so she's facing more and more uh, uh, sometimes it's really hard for if we can also we don't need to forget about the statelessness so also there is a statelessness who has no rights even to seek any kind of support they are afraid to be somewhere so uh, what we see that Asking for sexual or for uh, uh, reproductive uh, health care, mental care, uh, mental support, uh, like even information, where she can go, where is the shelters or the safe uh, uh, houses, where she can just a hotline, someone who talk with her in her languages. We know to be integrated, it takes long time sometimes. And if she is under a kind of domestic abuse, for example, or her husband or her, like uh, someone, a perpetrator are, are, are preventing her from learning or from integrating in the community, how she can have a, a, a support uh, by her language, for example, how where she can seek kind of uh, support to be uh, treated uh, uh, equally, where she can ask for uh, help. All this, I think, uh, it's kind of missing in the in the uh, gender equality uh, policy, and I think. Um, because the one who are uh, working on this are kind kind of is a European is not from migrant background and mostly from men or like male, not a female. So because we are not consultant, we don't have a lot of females in the policy making uh, decisions. And also uh, the, the gender lens is not there in all, as we heard also from my previous brilliant speakers, that uh, having community with, for women, it's not meaning that you are screening all the women policies or all the policies in the gender lens, like we didn't use that. So therefore, this kind of thing are missing. And because we are not continuously uh, consulting the migrants and, and, and refugees, uh, females or uh, community and minorities, uh, we missing this uh, kind of uh, details, which is so, so important. Because if I don't know that the reason women are not able to talk on phone in her language to seek asylum, how I can put this in the services. So I think we need to have uh, continuous um, uh, uh, 
what we can say, uh, consultation and paying attention to those communities, uh, giving more uh, uh, support for refugee-led organization or migrant-led organization, supporting them as again eco, uh, because all of uh, the previous brilliant uh, speakers saw a lot that I would like to say, because uh, supporting those in, uh, NGOs who are really trying to work and bring this information to the uh, decision makers uh, need also to be helped and supported. We are not able to do all of that. However, we are trying from time to time to collect all this data. Uh, we would like to have more um, uh, uh, role for for NGOs, states, uh, uh, all the stakeholders to look into this kind of uh, uh, gaps, to work more and more, to invest more time and more resources, to have uh, uh, better chances, not only for the, the, the migrant and refugees uh, and LGBTIQ or other communities, which is like even the disability uh, people or community or even elderly, but also sometimes the host community needs kind of support and they are not able even to have it. When I ask some some German friends somehow, I'm, Ger I'm in Germany and asking for some services, they really uh, tell me that oh, I don't know where is that exactly I can find this. So I think we need to have kind of uh, uh, media uh, and, and advocacy, advocating more in the media or in every platforms to uh, give this kind of information where people can seek a, a support and can be uh, treated and uh, uh, supported. Uh, I will not take long time. I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Shaza. And your, uh, your need uh, for more information and, you know, uh, the need to have uh, a gender lens is, 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 I think, highlighted by many things that we've heard also from uh, other interventions. Um, and I, I'm very uh, conscious of the fact that we've come to the end of the panel, but I have to confess, uh, listening to all of you, there is one question that I do want to actually, uh, Hannah, Halle, if you will allow me, uh, I want to put it to you because um, we've all uh, focused on the vulnerabilities, the fragilities, the need to help uh, and be very much uh, part of the process of encouraging and empowering refugee migrant women uh, and others. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm a, a storyteller. Uh, I'm a, I, I believe very much as you did in images and narratives. And the question that popped into my mind, and I'm giving you a minute or two to respond to it before I hand over the floor to, um, to Anila, uh, is really about a positive image, role models, inspirational stories. Uh, do you think that that is also part of the, if I could say, the, the, the problem in a sense that, yes, there are very strong women out there, uh, women who want to be part of the society, who have all the qualifications and who are being made to feel, uh, as you said, inferior. But there are also women uh, like you, um, like Anila, um, others around this, this table, this virtual table. Shouldn't we be also making those stories of success uh, in different domains, more visible uh, to the media, to the academics, to the policy makers, to people like Nuria uh, and others around the table. A question for you, Hale. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say that I really enjoyed the panel discussion, uh, uh, very insightful. And thank you, Shara, for, for your question. I think the notion of, neuro yeah, talking about role models is very important, uh, having positive uh, examples. Uh, but at the same time, I see that role models, the way they are used uh, in in many organizations and in policy or other instances, it, this is, actually they are a symbol of success. So they use that image to tell others, so look, if, if they can do it, you can do it as well. So it is actually becomes a kind of blame game instead of inspiration i i would i always say that people use me as a role model which is which happens very often i always say you know i want to be a role model as an inclusive leader for everybody uh, and my presence is very important because i am a woman of color i have a refugee background and i emphasize that all the time but i want to have the power to use that story and when the others use it, they use it to, because if I, when I use it, I talk about my vulnerability and success. When the other use it, they use only my 
successes to show that it's possible. So we don't need to change the system. But I always say, we need these stories but told by the people themselves so that they don't become tokens, but they always use the story to show what's necessary to change the structures. So give the power to people themselves and uh, be, be careful about tokenism. Thank you very much indeed, Hadi. So uh, wise words to bring this, as you said, fascinating uh, and insightful conversation to an end. Hadi, thank you indeed. Uh, Anila, uh, I'm not going to wrap up. I, I think you will have ample opportunity to take this discussion further in the working groups that are planned for afterwards. So I'll take my leave. Uh, Anil, I'll give you the floor and I'll say thank you to the panelists. I've really learned a lot and uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed this discussion. And uh, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay healthy, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shada, and thank you, everyone. Uh, so uh, it's, it's amazing to see, and I'm going to share my uh, screen if I can say. Okay, I'm just going to change. Because uh, there was a one triangle which I was um, uh, showing when uh, Caroline uh, from uh, UNHCR was talking. And this is a dry gram which we discover while we are working. Like we really want to make this uh, tree a triangle um, as a diamond. And they, the triangle is working in uh, individually, but it's not working in collaboration. So that's what we are trying to do as a, um, a refugee migrant stateless uh, led an organization or um, uh, other stakeholder we really need to learn from our expertise but they this we need to make more structures way uh, so we can work together so thank you so much for looking forward now i will give the um, uh, floor to mariam uh, because now after this uh, um, debates this discussion we need to have more uh, working uh, towards how, the question of how, and uh, to figure it out, how we can uh, generate more solution, like a baby steps. So to see how in our capacity uh, we can do, and we can uh, analyze the steps and identify, pin down the possibilities of working together, because this is about the point of reimagine. So we really want to co-create, rebuild, reimagine our future. So I will give uh, the floor to Mariam and I'm gonna sh uh, try to share my screen or I don't know, Mariam like to share her screen. So she has a- Yeah, I can to... share my screen as yes, well. Okay, so right. Mariam, I'm gonna to try you. it. Um, so hello from me as well, as I want to keep the momentum going from that great um, panel discussion. I will keep it short. I'm the Vice Executive Director at the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice and we're co-hosting together with New Women Connectors. Um, and, as you already might have seen in the invitation, there are um, various themes and discussion groups that we'll, we'll now be heading to and the identification of those groups. So I'm gonna share my screen and I hope you can see it. So, ooh, now it's too big. Mm. Now, so we have four themes and the identification of those various themes and hereby working groups that we now will be heading to of the conference is premised on preliminary findings from New Women Connectors, Leading Resilience Program and our own, the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice, our own work on the international level, particularly within the UN Commission on the Status of Women, um, Generation Equality, as well as the feminist and women's action plan on which we are all part. Um, and the themes reflect our deep engagement with the EU gender strategy. And we will look forward to coming up with solutions as we already mentioned, it's about solutions and the how and recommendations together. And as you see the themes and working groups are first freedom from violence and stereotypes, second education, decent work and social protection. Theme three will be health and well-being, And um, last the fourth, theme inclusivity belonging and community and how it will work is that Anila will randomly um, put us in the working group so that might take a minute because we have to make sure that the workshop facilitators the moderators and our discussions within that groups are in the right group so um, please be patient with us um, it will take a few minutes I hope and then we'll all be ready and we have one hour to discuss and come up with solutions so keep it um, pointy and sharp and let's focus on how we can reimagine gender equality. Yeah, 
So I am looking forward to whoever is working with me in group three. To all the others, we'll see us again um, later. Have fun and enjoy it. Yes, thank you, Mariam. So uh, as uh, Mariam also said, now we are trying to divide ourselves for discussion only. So um, we have a support from uh, Nemu Bura from Kenya, from I Matter Oxfam, and she's dividing us. Please go ahead and uh, make us uh, into the breakout rooms. Um, so we are trying to be patient with us because this technology is te uh, teaching us we need to be patient and uh, I need to learn how we uh, digitally uh, use this magic to divide ourselves into the rooms. So are we going to in the rooms? Are we ready? Hello everyone. Yes, we are just about um, winding up on creating the rooms and shall notify you when I'm done. Thank you. So while uh, An Anemura, she's making us uh, prepare for our rooms, I will share after this uh, session for one hour, we're going to come back and I can request my uh, partner to stop the recording now because uh, in the breakout session we do not want to record we really want everyone uh, to feel comfortable in the discussion so there will be a note taker as well but there will be no official any recording and um, we really want to have all of you after one hour to uh, back in this main panel and then we can share what each group discuss uh, among ourselves so we have uh, more knowledge of inside of all the discussions we are having So uh, I will request for the all the um, uh, main responsible people for the reporting from each uh, theme uh, to share with us. Uh, so after having this discussion, we can open the floor for Q&A because I know as a big group, we really want to share our reflection, our experience and how everyone feel about the theme and discussion. So I will start uh, for the room number one from the theme number freedom from violence and stereotype and I would request Mahmoud to come and share what they have discussed in their room. So Mahmoud over to you. Uh, thank you Anila. In, in the room we were discussing as you just mentioned freedom from uh, violence and stereotype and it was quite interesting to kind of identify first of all what is freedom from violence and stereotype as, as creating more or less a space for people to be uh, free to be who they are and act uh, uh, upon it and for it to not be just on a superficial uh, uh, ideology but to actually uh, transcend multiple generations as well uh, of migrants. We talked a lot about how different uh, groups uh, experience uh, the like uh, are affected by the like are affected by the policies implemented, but they are not mentioned in the policies for a lack of language. So we highlighted so many times the importance of language and making sure that. Um, people on different groups are part of the policy making in order to ensure that everybody uh, and the, pol the policies that are created include everybody and uh, not uh, contribute to segregation of uh, different communities. We've talked a lot about different gaps uh, between uh, policies and uh, uh, people who are affected uh, by the policies and we highlighted many of them and as we returned so many times to the idea of language and the importance of it and the importance of many groups being part of uh, the policy. We also talked about uh, violence and domestic violence uh, in different communities and uh, we mentioned how it's important to have support throughout the process and reinsuring safety for people who are suffering uh, from violence. And we also highlighted how policies can contribute to um, the continuation of violence, like uh, policies that are related to uh, visas and stuff like that, that can contribute to uh, the, uh, the blockage of people in marriages that where they might be suffering uh, domestic violence. We had an example, for instance, of uh, uh, Denmark uh, in that case. We also had a lot of uh, very insightful recommendations uh, when it comes to power, the importance of empowering and strengthening different bodies that are 
uh, working uh, in changing uh, that reality. And also we talked about the importance of funding. We talked about the importance of awareness and uh, many other uh, recommendations that were very insightful. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you so much for sharing for the discussion from your uh, room. So I will request now from room number two to Grace and she will share what they have discussed in their room, which was uh, education, decent work and social protection. So Grace, over to you. Thank you, Anila. Um, yes, in our breakout room, we had a wonderful conversation with um, many amazing recommendations from our from our discussions. We talked about um, professional education being led by women. Uh, we talked about um, redistributing care burdens. We talked about education um, and having the right education. I think that was that was a really important distinction, um, especially coming from Zoltan's work, uh, looking to have education that is informed by the needs of migrant women and by um, their experiences um, to, to really speak to yeah, like I said, the, the needs. We also discussed blind application procedures in terms of uh, decent work uh, to combat hiring discrimination, um, as well as um, creating incentive programs for hiring migrants uh, to combat nationality discrimination, along with, you know, the many other intersectional forms of discrimination that migrant women experience. Um, that was a very big topic. We also discussed um, the representation of migrant women in policymaking, which really speaks to education, decent work, and social protection. The, the lack of representation and consultation of migrant women, which is really what this con uh, conference is all about, lead to the gaps that we're addressing. Um, and lastly, we also discussed um, fair accreditation policies for uh, both education and professional trainings to make sure that um, people who have migrated into the EU can um, be employed or educated at the level that they are truly at rather than having to start over after they've migrated. So I think that about covers it. But um, yes, thank you to all of our participants for a fantastic working group. Thank you, Grace. Thank you so much. It looks like you really had a good discussion. And thank you for sharing. So now I will request from the team number uh, three, Zuleha from Health and Wellbeing, and we're excited what you have uh, discussed in your uh, discussion. Zuleha. Yes, thank you. So we had a, a beautiful group of people, um, Shaza, Miriam, uh, Yanina, Diana, Carolyn, and Mia. And we had, um, yeah, we started off the discussion a bit, I guess, maybe a bit shy, <laughs> but we started to talk about what health and well-being means. So what do these terms actually mean? And um, from there, we saw health as being something that is related to physical and mental health and well-being related to the quality of life, to access to services, to feeling safe. Um, and then we started to share how uh, health and well-being is uh, experienced and we shared some best practices which um, one of them that we noted down uh, to do with sexual and reproductive health is normalizing the idea of not having children and having this individualized approach um, and using a cultural lens. So what we had also discussed uh, is health in three aspects. So general health, sexual reproductive health, and mental health. And one of the key um, sort of issues that we highlighted within the EU strategy is that mental health is not explicitly mentioned. Um, and this has further repercussions um, for refugee and migrant women. Um, we also mentioned some of the gaps um, and these by mentioning these gaps, it opened up avenues to speak about the how and to speak about recommendations. And what was also very interesting was that although we were speaking about health and well-being specifically, these seem to connect to um, the other themes of education, of community, of uh, inclusivity. So I just want to run through a few of the recommendations. Um, if you just give me a second to bring up the information. Um, 
so we spoke about um, language was one of the very important things, especially when it comes to mental health. And interestingly enough, this one was also connected to decent work and to labor and what Grace had just mentioned, because there seems to be a clear solution here. So when we are asking for mental health services in native languages, um, you have refugee and migrant women and refugee and migrants that come in already with these skills from their home countries with um, certificates and, and degrees and uh, accreditation, but they do not seem to be able to get the work or be able to get accredited in order to be psychologists or psychiatrists, which could actually really serve this, um, these communities. Um, so one of the other recommendations is uh, access to health coverage being uh, taken from a human rights approach so that regardless of your status as stateless or migrant or refugee, you should be able to access healthcare just as any other citizen in the country does. Um, and we also spoke about uh, the role of civil society um, organizations in helping to get financial support to help out community workers and healthcare professionals to fill this gap. Um, and yes, that mental health needs to be mentioned um, explicitly within the EU policy. Yeah, thank you. I hope I covered everything. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Zalaika. Zalaika. So now uh, our last theme uh, discussion was inclusivity, belonging, and community, which was led by uh, Dr. Lara. So Lara, over to you. Thank you, Anila, and I'm so excited and invigorated hearing all of these different experiences and insights that um, you've discussed in these groups specifically since, you know, our theme. And I was so honored to be around all these policy experts, gender experts to, to really dive deep um, is that inclusivity, belonging, community kind of covers all of the other themes in many ways or intersects, right? And so um, that's very interesting. That was very interesting. And again, thank you for everyone that, that shared. We, we took a similar approach first talking about um, you know, what inclusivity belonging community means um, and how it's experienced, particularly also in the, in the policy realm. So I think one of the major um, points that we identified as a gap or policy mismatch is that in lived experiences, we often talk about inclusivity, belonging and community, but in policy language just then translates into intersectionality and gender mainstreaming, right? And so how do does, how, what, what's this mismatch match between the policy language that is being used and the lived experiences or how we might describe them um, was, was a very interesting part. Another main finding that I would like um, to mention, and there's so many, we totally ran out of that space in, the, in those little boxes that we created, so we're very excited. Um, another one that kind of um, uh, relates to this is, of course, the new action plan on integration and inclusion, which now has added inclusion as part of integration, right? So, um, and we learned a little bit about uh, the, the background here and talked about differences and on how we conceive of integration um, and inclusion. But I think the main kind of takeaway, if, if, I, if I may make that assumption, is that it, there, there's a lot of policies happening, but they're happening in silos. There's very little interaction between the different policies. So we have the new EU migration and asylum pact, which barely mentions, you know, gender or gendered experiences in it. Then we have the new action plan on integration. Then we have the gender equality strategy, right? And so they all kind of operate within their own sphere, but how do we connect them? And um, as Kakeli mentioned, um, uh, was like, why do we operate within these uh, binaries of either or, right? Why is it either in this one policy and not in the other? Like, how can we really make these connections? And that was one of the main, main recommendations that we ultimately came up with of how do we connect them? And how does this connection ultimately speak to the, to the continuum of gendered migrant experiences, right? So one policy governs this one part of a migration pattern or migration experiences, and then you move into a different one. But where's the continu 
continuity with regards to that. So that was another um, major recommendation. And then lastly, um, and this was mentioned by Annalise, and I really want to bring this up here, is the praise for you know um, this collaborative spirit that we put together here um, and creating more forums and more platforms like this, even with the mention maybe to do this um, every month. So those are our those were our recommendations. Um, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lara. No, it's excited. I'm just thinking if uh, anyone else like to share, especially with the discussant, uh, because each room has a discussant. Uh, so if you like to share anything uh, regarding uh, your discussion, uh, then uh, the, this is the time. Other uh, than that, we can open um, floor for Q and A. So yeah, now it's time for all of us to speak, share our experience and reflection. Anyone else like to share anything about the discussion they had in the groups? So whoever like to speak, they can unmute themselves. I think they can, um, and they can feel free to share their experience, their reflection, or feedback, or anything. Yes, Shaza. Sorry, I'm speaking a lot today, but uh, I really enjoyed the discussion in our uh, group, and it was amazing. And I, uh, what I found it interesting that uh, that this problem sometimes is not only for migrants and and, and refugees, uh, but also it's uh, a problem like if we can specify on mental health. Uh, issues uh, is about even the, the host community as well. So even the people who are uh, from the, the country, they are suffering to have the information. They don't know how to seek this information, where they can find it. And uh, so it is um, a general lack of uh, information and maybe uh, awareness where you can like if you have this you can go there and as i said before actually uh, when i ask some friends from german community somehow they also are not uh, not uh, uh, like will <laughs> will uh, informed by this information uh, the other things that uh, we uh, we find it uh, within our group uh, that there is there is something missing in the in the in the uh, the gender equality uh, 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 policy and strategy, which is the mental health. Uh, there is something uh, are not mentioned in general. The the migrants and refugee themselves they are not mentioned so far. Uh, we were treated as a minority, although uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, refugees and migrants and people who are from the migrant background. So it's not a minority, actually. It's uh, <laughs> half of the community almost. And uh, I think in this regard, we need to, to work more and more to ensure the inclusive uh, or the inclusion of everyone in the community in this uh, uh, policies. And again, insisting on working uh, uh, um, like in all uh, level together to uh, men um, monitoring as well all the process uh, from the uh, affected community, if we can say. Thank you, thank you, Shaza. Now I will request uh, to have a like an initial reflection from Janina. She's uh, joining us from Germany. So over to you, Janine. Thank you so much, um, Anila. I'm uh, Janina. I work at the Center for Area Studies. I'm a migration researcher, and um, I think for me, what I really very much appreciate about this event is our focus on on recommendations because I think we've come from a focus on, on problems and honestly policymakers are still very much in this focus on problems towards a focus on, on good practice. And then we had this explosion of good practice in the migration community. And now really you are going the next step to say, okay, but now let's ma not make a list of tons of good practice, but take a couple that will inspire us and really ask for, for recommendations. How do we how do we go to the next step? And I think it's really um, it's really a good time to do that now because in 
um, my research on, on um, the role of uh, migrants and refugees in COVID-19 times, I can see that two of the, of the points that have been made are really, right now there's a window of opportunity for that. And the first one is really to take, um, take a human rights approach a non-discriminatory approach to um, basically access to services, access to health, access to work, because suddenly in times of COVID-19, it's not nice to have to include everyone, for example, in a city, but it's really essential. So this is the moment to say, okay, and we have seen that in some places that actually works. So now we have to fight for keeping that working. And the second point is, as um, Shasa shared that with us, that um, in um, many communities, suddenly, um, the community became aware how much migrants and refugees contribute to, to the society. And this is really the moment to say, okay, and if we had the, the not, not even the support, but just the, the, the option to, to really have our, have our scope for action and to really do what we're capable of doing, then we could do, could do even more. So thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I will like uh, already we are trying and request all of you to share your reflection or Q&A if you have. So the floor is open if you have any question or any feedback. Elizan, seems you want to say something? I do. Yeah, okay, yes, because we left uh, we left our discussion. It was the uh, theme number two. It was about diesel work, social protection and education. And it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. And I wanted to bring it to the main panel because I want to see if anyone is working on this. We were talking about uh, obviously discrimination against migrants and refugees um, in terms of, of employment. Um, so we, I mean, obviously we spoke about uh, uh, blind applications, et cetera, but uh, we are facing a real struggle when it comes to, um, you know, forced, migra uh, forced migration and their ability to stay in their host countries. Um, and the options that they offered with. And a lot of empl uh, employers actually don't provide them with the contract under the, the excuse that, oh, we don't want to be involved in the, visa, uh, in the visa process. I don't know if anyone is working on this, but this is a massive, massive thing because eventually what happens is that employers actually end up either uh, disregarding highly qualified people, really, really committed, hardworking people that are just that are migrants just because they don't want to get involved. Uh, there's a lack of um, not only consideration, but I also think a lack of knowledge from uh, from recruiters and from uh, actual companies. And that's why they want to steer away from any migrants or, or refugees who have maybe irregular situations, if you will. Um, and third, they actually end up hiring probably under uh, under um, qualified people, um, just because they don't have those issues. So, I mean, it is something that we struggle with on a daily basis as migrants. And I really want to see if any one of the participants is actually working on this, or they, if they have. I mean, Christina had some uh, kind of like great ideas uh, about this. It was uh, we were talking about some. Um, Kind of like encouragement uh, by the by the governments maybe um, to have like maybe cut the cuts on their taxes or or something like that. But I don't know if anyone has any ideas or uh, if um, you know if someone is working on this. Maybe there's like maybe legal uh, information that we can uh, that we can use or maybe they provide some legal I mean Zoltan uh, obviously he left unfortunately but um, maybe also help like litigation help um, that they can help migrants with this issue I just wanted to bring it in uh, to see if anyone has any any suggestions any solutions if they're working on something or if they have any information and thank you thank you Razan. so anyone else like to say anything um... Other than that, I will request Lara to share about the, our way forward, like about, because we have a uh, um, uh, need to start further uh, steps as well. So Lara, over to you. 
Thank you. Although I'm I'm not quite ready to leave this this space yet because I'm feeling all of this this energy and this um, this inspiration. But yes, um, it is actually very difficult to find closing remarks for this inspiring and very in energizing conference. Um, again, with our important task of reimagining a truly gender equal and inclusive Europe, and. I, so I guess I would like to almost reframe this as not closing remarks, but rather invitational remarks, um, because we're just getting started, right? We're, we're just getting started to reimagine um, gender equality in, in Europe. So here are then my invitational um, remarks. Uh, so New Women Connectors and the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice invite you to continue these conversations, to stay connected with your working groups and to connect with other working groups, to join us in continuous reimagination re of a truly gender equal and inclusive a Europe that addresses migration in all different aspects and, and across policy spectrums. We also invite you to, to grow with us um, in partnership and collaboration and to support, support each other, to support each other's work, you know, organizations, whether it's a social media like a phone call, a text, um, Let's just keep, keep all of these positive energies going. Um, more concretely, with regards to you know, the objectives of this conference, we would like to um, invite you to contribute to the guidance note on the EU gender equality strategy beyond this conference. So all of the insights that um, and questions and concerns um, that you've raised in your working groups will be part um, of the conference and part of the, the guidance note. So we invite you to keep them coming. Um, as I said, we're, we're just getting started. The guidance note will be directed at key stakeholders involved in the implementation of the EU gender equality strategy and will address the specific gaps or mismatches identified for each theme. So the guidance note will include recommendations on moving forward together as we plan for the next five years of a truly gender equal and inclusive Europe. So with this invitation, I pass it um, back to Anila to Thank close you. the session. Yes, uh, there are so many um, uh, moments which I really felt I uh, so energetic as Lara said, and also thankful because I am so thankful to have all the people around us who do not even cooperate and uh, give us support, but also do understand like why we are doing this and we why we need to do this as, as a system, as a process. And that's what we are trying to do. There are so many uh, partners, which I, um, I didn't forget, but I, I didn't have the moment to say a thankful um, note to them. First of all, I really like to uh, thank you for all the our, um, uh, you know, support from the uh, Women Refugee Commission who are based in New York, but they are really supporting us. Uh, I met a Oxfam, they are huge uh, supporting to us since uh, 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 our launch of Leading Resilience, Oxfam Noib, based in uh, Brussels and um, uh, in Netherlands and uh, uh, Girls, which is newly initiative. Uh, I'm one of the co-founder, but still, we are happy to have them and European Coalition, which is part of Global Refugee Led Network and uh, uh, Europe of um, uh, Stateless Net Network. They are really helping us and we are trying to bring more inclusivity. So that's why we always love to work with them. And um, I hope I'm not missing anyone. If I am, I am, please apologize doing, yes, Kudwa. So sorry, <laughs> Mahmoud, uh, yeah, Kudwa, uh, they are based in um, uh, Spain and they are also helping us a lot. And I hope I'm not missing anyone. But as I said, if I am, I am, then I really apologize. And I, I also appreciating uh, students who are joining us to help us in the note taking. They are, uh, they are amazing. I re we really uh, trying to learn from the, your knowledge and your experience. And in the last, uh, not least, like my team, uh, Nurash, who is uh, sitting in uh, Denmark or Sweden, I always mix, and uh, Jaffa uh, and Reem and Pia. They are all refugee women, and uh, still their journey is totally new. But they they are sharing their experience and uh, showing the motivation how we can uh, change this um, Europe as our new home. And uh, yeah, so yeah, this is uh, and not as Lara said, it is so overwhelming. I'm feeling like a festival, like because we are sharing all the uh, thoughts openly and sharing what we want to do. But leaving this, 
we used to having this uh, habit or one kind of logo before leaving or closing uh, since march we are doing is called a uh, logo for coping together growing together so i will request everyone if you feel free to turn on your mic and turn on your camera so we make a small video and all of us will say coping together growing together when i say 1 2 3 then we all say in a one voice so we are recording this as a solidarity as a energy, energy uh, because sometimes we really need to shout out to show our energy so i will say 1 2 3 and we will say coping together growing together and uh, yes so already okay i am taking it as a yes so i will say 1 2 3 and i'm turning on my uh camera so we can record <laughs> okay are you okay okay 1 2 3 go coping oh, together, together. Oh, yeah. going together. together thank you everyone thank you everyone so so thank happy you. to have you all thank you jenin thank you manika everyone thank you so much nuria and thank i have everybody thank you thank you thank you thank everyone you. Thank, thank you thank you so much